The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Remain standing as I read the scriptures. I'll be reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the first 12 verses. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 12. This is God's Word. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Let's pray once more. Lord, we are grateful once again for your word. We pray that you would attend the reading and the preaching of your word with great authority and power, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the axioms that many people who are later in life will give to you, many Many, one of the instructions that you'll hear over and over again or pieces of advice that, you're, that you'll hear over and over again is that we always must be improving. This is true almost in every area of life. If you speak to a, a businessman, they'll constantly talk about the need to innovate and the need to improve, the need to Im- improve how they're doing their job and how their companies are operating. This is the case as well in uh, athletics. This is uh, uh, the opening of a new baseball season, and one of the constant subplots the team you're following is, how have they gotten better this year than they were last year? There's actually a great tradition of improvement and even self-improvement in the United States. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was famous for this. When he was in his 20s, he had already had two businesses that failed, and he had a child out of wedlock respects his life was a mess and so he he undertook what his project of moral perfection and in this project of moral perfection he put together a little diary and he put a, a page for each of the virtues that he had identified and recorded his progress in each of those virtues every day and he said that he marked with a, a little brown check mark every fault that he found upon examination at the end of the day Of course, that kind of improvement is misguided. The Bible tells us that moral perfection in this life is not something that we will attain to. Uh, You remember, of course, that John said if anyone says he's without sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. And yet, improvement is a necessary goal even in the context of ministry. Uh, You remember what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in one of the verses that I like to quote uh, the most particularly to those who are in seminary, he said in 1 Timothy 4.15, let your progress be evident to all. In other words, he wasn't expecting Timothy to have achieved some kind of maturity, certainly not perfection in the sense that we talk about it in any particular area of ministry, but he says to Timothy that in all these areas that I've laid out for you, people ought to be able to look back and see that you're progressing, that you're growing, that you're learning that there is some level of improvement. And Paul strikes a similar note here, not to an individual Timothy, but actually to the church as a whole. He actually says it twice at the beginning of the passage that I read, and then 
end of the passage that I read. You'll note it in verse 1. He says, you, you know how to walk, you know how to please God, but in the midst of this, I urge you to excel still more. And then he uses the exact same phrase at the end of the text in verse 10. We urge you, brethren, to excel still more. This particular congregation, in many respects, was a model congregation. We've seen that earlier in the book. We've seen that Paul says that their reception of the gospel is a mark of the fact that they are a true and living and vibrant church. Paul also looked to his own ministry in their midst as a kind of model. He says, our, I, we know our work wasn't in vain. And he goes on to describe why he knows that and why it's an example to others. And even in chapter 3, we see that Paul, because of his high esteem for them, cared for them and held out and care for them as a kind of model for other ministers. And here in chapter 4, what he urges them to do is to continue to excel even beyond what they had already accomplished. And if we could break it down, we can break down this text. There are two primary areas in which Paul wants them to really excel, to improve, to remain focused upon. And these are delicate areas for us to discuss today. But indeed, we must discuss them because they come up and play such a prominent role in the Scriptures. Paul says primarily that the two ways in which you have to continue to excel, not that there is any great fault at this point or any great rebuke that he needs to issue, but the two areas in which you have continue to excel, you have to continue to focus upon, you have to continue to improve upon, are, first of all, their control of themselves, of all, their approach to money and to work. Now, it's possible that Paul would highlight different things were he addressing a different congregation. It's possible that if the Apostle Paul got to know you, he might address one or two different items. It's hard to say, but it's undeniable that these are the things that he addressed to the Thessalonian congregation, and therefore these are things that ought to be priorities in our mind as we seek to obey the teaching of the Scriptures. Now, let's look at how he uh, approaches this beginning in verses 1 and 2. And remember, Paul was not with the Thessalonian Christians for very long. But in the context of his teaching, he had not only delivered to them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, although, of course, that was always of primary importance in Paul's preaching, but Paul had also evidently, in the short time he had with them, also instructed them about what godly living looked like. In and of itself, I think, ought to be notable for us. Paul had spent, we don't know how long, perhaps two months with these Thessalonian Christians. We know it was at least three Sabbaths, and it was probably a little longer than that. But in that short period of time, Paul knew that, or Paul knew that as he looked back, he had instructed them on these very, we might say, practical matters of the faith. He says it in verse 1, just as you received instruction from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, and in fact, you're obeying this largely. We want you to excel still more. And then look at verse 2. You know what command we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. I don't think I have to tell any of you this, but there are many ministries, many even congregations of the Lord Jesus Christ that have made it a practice not to instruct people in some of the areas that Paul is going to instruct the Thessalonians in. And, and notice that Paul had already instructed them in, in his two months with them. And that, I think, should convict us as we think about our own priorities in ministry. If you had been preaching, as Paul had, for two months in a congregation, would you be able to say, yes, we, we shared with you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we also shared with you in very pointed language, very clear and biblical language, what your obligations were as someone who had been saved by God in Christ. We had, we had shared with you, as it were, the commands of God, uh, not as a, a way of earning God's favor in a meritorious sense, but because of what God had done for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul did not neglect to share these things, to command these things, of God's people, even when he had a very short time with them. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that there are some 
ministers who pride themselves uh, and never addressing these kinds of issues, uh, and never addressing the law of God, and never addressing how it is that we're supposed to live, never really addressing sanctification at all. And here's Paul, and he can look back and say, I've already told you these things. I'm just giving you these reminders. You're already doing them in large measure, but I need you to excel still more because of your out of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verses 1 and 2, he puts it very broadly, but he does indicate, of course, that not only were these his words, but these are words that actually come from Christ himself. This really should always be the end of any discussion for a genuine Christian. If the Lord Jesus Christ has said something, if God's word commands something, then that ought to settle it in our minds. And more than once in this text, Paul reminds aren't just my words, Jesus Christ himself. We dare not disobey God's commands. Now, when he gets into the specifics, or when he gets into the details of what living to please God looks like, beginning in verse 3, what we see is, first of all, that Paul identifies this major area of their lives, indeed, major area of all of which needs to be in submission to God and to His Word. And I would say that this could be, as I said, summarized in this way, that we're to control ourselves and to appropriately handle ourselves sexually. Beginning in verse 3, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. I need to explain that phrase briefly, I think, because Paul begins by saying this, we often hear discussion today about the will of God. Typically what people mean when they ask about the will of God or talk about the will of God is something narrowly specific to them and their individual situation. You know, what should I do? Which job should I take? What decision should I make in this particular area of my life? Now, as we look through the New Testament, there are ten times when this uh, this description is used, this phrase is used, the will of God. As far as I can tell, in none of those ten uh, uh, uses of the term does it mean what we typically mean when we talk about the will of God. Uh, what it means in all of those cases, and certainly what it means in this case, is revealed. Uh, for instance, we see in First Peter, that God has revealed His will to them, and that is that they suffer, and that they suffer in an appropriate manner. And elsewhere in the Gospels, we see the will of God used in just that way to describe the revealed counsel of God in the Scriptures. And here it's the same. We see that Paul says, this is the will of God. Do you want to understand God's will for your life? God's will for your life is that you be sanctified, and in particular, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now again, I don't think we should understand Paul's instruction here to mean that the Thessalonian Christians had a pronounced problem with sexual immorality any more than any other churches. In fact, Paul doesn't rebuke them here in this passage. Paul's very capable of rebuking people for problems with sexual immorality. He does it over and over again in, in 1 Corinthians, but here he doesn't do that but I think Paul is simply aware of human nature. He, he's aware of the context in which they found themselves. I, I think Paul is also particularly aware, in the case of the Thessalonians, of the pressure that they were under as individual Christians and as the church. Paul knew that they were suffering. Uh, Paul knew that they were undergoing great stress and hardship. I don't have to tell you this, but it's often the case that in the midst of great hardship, great suffering, great struggle that we're prone to these particular sins. Here he says, you need to abstain from sexual immorality. And he, he unpacks this in a way that is a bit peculiar and in fact has caused some commentators to have some disagreement because what he says then in verse 5, and I'm reading here from the New American Standard Version, is that what in particular he's talking about is that each of you know how to what he says is, possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, I would say that all the phrases...
phrases Paul uses in this letter, uh, of all the phrases Paul uses in this particular letter, this may be the one, in fact, I think this is the one that is most disputed and most difficult. You'll even compare your English translations and see that the English uh, translators render this uh, differently. Some talk about it being uh, controlling his vessel. The New American Standard says, possess his own vessel. If we, were to, if we were to translate it in a strictly wooden and literal way, it would be something like this. Each of you should learn to acquire your own vessel in holiness and honor. The question is, what does Paul mean when he says that? And how is that related to this command against sexual immorality? Really, the main options that commentators have suggested, and I think this covers the range of possibilities. The first is that what Paul is really saying here to these men who are receiving this letter is that they, they need to get married, and they need to get married as an, as an alternative to living in any kind of immorality. And so there, the possess his own vessel, or the acquire your own vessel in holiness and honor, would really be speaking of the fact that they need to, rather than living these that in fact they need to obey what uh, biblical wisdom suggests and, and, and be married. And indeed we can see Paul strike this note in other places, not least to his instructions to widows in the pastoral epistles where he says that these widows who are of a certain age, the best thing for them to do is to remarry so that they're not subject to all kinds of temptations. The other option, of course, is that what Paul's telling them in a kind of blanket way is that they just simply Now, I should say that there are difficulties with both of these interpretations. And in, and in one sense, they're not mutually exclusive, because certainly one would cover the other. However, I would say this, that the verb possess in the New American Standard or control, if you're using, generally does mean to acquire something. And in fact, the word for vessel that's used here is elsewhere in the New Testament used to refer to the body and is used to refer to often the whole person. You can see in Acts 9.15, this is used of an individual, not just their body, but their whole instrument or my chosen vessel. And I do think that this fits uh, as well with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. So if I had to pick one, if we had to pick one, I think... But because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, as I say, that doesn't negate the other. Listen, in whatever state you find yourself, control your own body. Control your own sexual drive and your, sec and your expression of sexuality. John Stott summarizes it well when he says this, Sex has a God-given place, marriage and a God-given style, honor, and holiness. And that does seem to summarize well what Paul is saying here in this text. I would also note in verse 8 the seriousness of this command. This isn't a peripheral matter. This isn't something that Paul thinks they can either take or leave. Look at what he says. He who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. The stakes couldn't be higher in Paul's mind for this kind of appropriate expression of sexuality. Look, too, at the stakes as expressed in the alternatives to this. One alternative, he says, is in verse 5, that if you're not doing this, then perhaps you would be subject to living in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That, Paul sees, is a very real possibility for some of these Thessalonians, that in the area of their sexuality, they're no different than, than Gentiles. Isn't that some of the disturbing kind of statistical evidence that we find today? That even within 
around differ very little from those in the world. Paul sees that as a great concern. Look at what else he says with respect to the alternative. Uh, the alternative, he says is as well, is that we would perhaps transgress or defraud the, a brother in the matter. This is verse 6 where he says this. He also says in verse 6 in that same verse that the alternative to obedience to this instruction is not only to defraud your brother, but actually to put yourself in danger of the vengeance of the Lord. The Lord is the avenger in all of these things. And note this, just as we told you before and solemnly warned you, Paul's actually covered this with them during his short time. And finally, he says that the alternative to this is what he calls impurity. And that's not what God has called us to as his children. Verse 7, God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but for the purpose of sanctification, for the purpose of greater holiness. Now, I think we should pause at this point and ask ourselves this question. Is this what you see as God's will for you? This kind of appropriate control an appropriate outlet for uh, your sexuality. Paul says this is God's will for your life, God's will for your sanctification. It's something we need to take seriously and to embrace as God's will as well. Second question we might ask that's related to this is how much are you and how much will you teach these kinds of things to those under your care? It's very easy to avoid subjects like this. Certainly much more comfortable to avoid subjects like this. It's one of the reasons why I think there's great value in consecutive expositional preaching. Because you can't very well stand up in front of your congregation having just preached 1 Thessalonians 3 and say, now we're going to move on to a new book or we're going to move on to verse 13. You can't do that because they'll know that you're trying to cover up something. No, it's important for us to make this not only a priority in our own lives, as we look at ourselves and what God's will is for us, uh, but also in our own teaching and preaching ministries with respect to a congregation. Paul made it a kind of priority in his preaching and teaching ministry to address issues just like this, in just this kind of way. And we ought to do the same today. Now the second major issue that Paul addresses begins in 9. And it not so much with their sexuality, their expression of sexuality within marriage, their avoidance of impurity, but with their love for one another. But I don't want to leave that vague because Paul doesn't leave it vague. He does say this in verse 9, no, as to the love of the brethren. And so we could put that as the topic for this, uh, these next few verses. It is about love for the brethren, but, but I want to be very specific because Paul's very specific. It's really about love for Brethren, as expressed, so it's not just the sense of love, this sense of fellow feeling for other people, uh, this vague sense of generosity of spirit. No, it's actually generosity of money, and 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 care for them in a financial way. Look at what he says. What you, he said first of all, you're doing very well in this. We know this from chapter one that the Thessalonian church was actually excelling they to other churches because even in the midst of their suffering, they still gave inward, didn't look only to their own interests, they looked to the others, just as we read about in Philippians 2 with respect to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, in one sense, I, I don't have a need to write to you and to really uh, demand anything additional, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And, and then we see in verse 10 precisely what he means by this. Why is it that, that they have demonstrated their love? Why is it that he knows that they love one another? Because what you have done is you've given to the brethren who are in uh, Macedonia. And then what does he say in verse 10? Well, it's the same thing that he said in verse 1. You've given to those in Macedonia. Now I want you to improve. Now I want your progress to be all. Or now, as the New American Standard puts it, now you need to excel still more. You haven't arrived, even though you've given in an exemplary fashion. 
even though you've given sacrificially, even though others are looking to you and learning from you, it doesn't mean you cross that off your list as if you've achieved that virtue. No, you've done well, and you need to excel still more in giving. This is what he says. Here's how he says that will play out, beginning in verse 11. You need to make it your ambition in life. This is your goal with respect to finances and work. Your goal is that you're going to lead a quiet life, business, you're going to work with your hands, and that will allow you to, what Paul says in verse 12, behave properly toward outsiders. Now you see what he's saying there. What he's saying there is you need to work hard, you need to be content, you need to live a modest life. And in the midst of that modesty, we might say simplicity, Paul says quietness here, but in the midst of that kind of life, well, that, what that will enable you to do then is that will enable you to use the resources that God has entrusted to you so that you can help others and that there will not be any need among you. That's verse 12. So you see, this is the model that Paul puts in front of them. And, and just as it is hard for us to uh, talk to even Christian even those under care in the church, just as it is hard to, for us to discuss with them matters of sexuality, oh, how much harder is it for us to discuss these kinds of matters with them? No, what you should be doing, what you should be striving for is, is a quiet life. What you should be striving for is working hard so that you can give more to other people. Uh, I think it's fair to say if you, if you discuss these two issues in this detail, you will face opposition. You'll be stepping on people's toes. But this is the apostolic instruction that Paul gives to the Thessalonian church, and this is the apostolic instruction he gives to our church. It, it, it's, it's instruction that we need to take seriously as well. Although it's, it may be the case in a setting like this that many of us are not called to work with our hands in quite the way that Paul's describing, it's, it's probably likely, in fact, I, I pray that it is likely, that most of us will, will receive a, a living from, from the gospel, as, as the Bible puts it. And, and so we won't, in one sense, have to do exactly what these first recipients of the letter did in order to earn a living. But nonetheless, nonetheless, there are principles here for all of us, aren't there? That our ambition should be to live in such a way so that we can share to an even greater extent the financial resources that God has entrusted to us. And, and certainly, not only should we do that by example, but that needs to be part of our teaching. Think about Paul saying this to this church. Would you have said this to this church? This is a church that is struggling. This is a church that is suffering. This is a church that had every incentive to think that they deserved some kind of outlet sexually, and they certainly deserved to be able to spend their money however they wanted to spend it. And Paul says, no, that's not what the Lord Jesus Christ has called you to. Now, all these things, of course, are good in themselves and lead to good outcomes. So we know from even advice of the kind that Benjamin Franklin would give, that being careful with your money and, and, and being careful with your body are, are, are generally good things. Those are things that lead to good outcomes. But, and, and certainly when we look at the Christian church, we can say it's no accident that, that the major areas in which Christian ministers falter are, are these two areas, either failing to control themselves sexually in, in, in purity and, and failing to to handle their money in the way that the scriptures uh, instruct us to. So, th so there, it's obvious in some sense that these things ought to be major issues. But I want to point out something to you that uh, comes through in almost every one of these verses. The importance of this instruction that Paul gives isn't just because of its practical relevance, just because it will protect us from the major errors made besetting sins of the ministry. They're actually important uh, 
because of God, because they come from God. Look at how Paul frames all of this. In verse 1, he says, we are walking in a certain way. He says in verse 2 that these instructions came directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says again in verse 3 that sanctification, this kind of sanctification, is God's will for their life. Again, in in verse 6, he says that the Lord will be the avenger. He has called us to holiness, verse 7, and that we're taught by God. The great contrast running through this chapter, the great contrast that runs through every instruction that Paul gives, I think, comes out most clearly in verse 5. Because what Paul says in verse 5 is this, that the way I'm teaching you to live is the way that's indicative of someone who knows God. And to live another way is to live like the Gentiles whom he says, do not know God. So what runs through all of this is that these are instructions that are given to us directly by God. They're reflective of whether or not we know God at all or have come to be known by Him, as the Apostle will say elsewhere. These are God's rules for our life, and God is the one whom we fear, and God is the one whom we serve. If you know God... And the only way to know Him is through the Lord Jesus Christ and faith alone in Him. And these words are not optional. This is why God saved you. This is God's will for your life. And this is the way in which He, as our King and our Lord, commands us to live. And these are the instructions He commands us to pass on to others. And of course, He's the one who's provided for us the means by which we can take satisfaction in what He has given. He's the one whom it says has given us everything we need for a life like this and godly living according to apostolic instruction. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your word, for its clarity, for its precision, for indeed the way in which it confronts our own sinfulness. We ask that by your Spirit, you might not only cause truths to sink deep within us, but empower us to continue to be sanctified according to your law. And we ask all of this. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.